Good morning, class. Hi, I'm Keith Moore, and we welcome you to Faith School. Faith School is the place where my spirit is fed, where my faith grows stronger, and where I learn how to be an overcomer. God's plan for us is a good plan. He said, I know the thoughts that I think towards you to give you an expected end. It's, it's a good plan. Don't believe the people who talk about that tragedy and, and loss and, and, and all the ugly stuff that's in the world is somehow God's plan for you and His will for your life. No, it is not. Uh, there's an enemy in the world and there is curse and sin in the world and death in the world. And that's why all of this is, is, is about, but thank God <laughs> there's God. <laughs> and He is the answer through Jesus, the Master, the Savior. Um, you can, you know, we're, we're in the world and we'll have to deal with some of the stuff that's in the world, but as believers, we're not of the world in the sense of our internal, uh, who we are, what we are, and you can't control everything that's around you, per se, or happening in the world, but you can control what happens inside you, your response to things, your choice of whether you doubt, you despair, you fear and fall apart, or whether you don't. You resist that and you go another direction. You reach up to God in faith, you pray and reach out to Him in expectation, He's real. He'll respond. He'll help you a lot <laughs> and bring you out. Hallelujah. Let's pray and believe God for, for exactly what we need to get us from where we are to the next place in Him today. Father, all of us agree together as touching this, asking You for grace and anointing and help Open our eyes to see and hear and understand things we haven't before and things that we've let slip remind us of. Show us how to put it into practice. And we say, Lord, uh, your will be done in our lives. And we know that's good. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Look, please, in Hebrews, the third chapter, uh, we've been on a series we're calling Overcoming Unbelief. Let's continue in this today. Hebrews 3, 18, well, verse 12 talked about, said, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Verse 18, To whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not? So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. Unbelief robbed God's people that he delivered out of Egyptian bondage from a life of abundance and rest and plenty in Canaan's land. And the reason this is brought up to us is because chapter 4 verse 1 says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. He's saying uh, these, are, these are warnings so don't do what they did and let happen to you what happened to them. 1 Corinthians 10 talks about the same thing. Uh, it talks about uh, that first generation uh, of Israelites that were brought out of Egyptian bondage and how that they were all under the cloud, passed through the sea, drank of the water that came out of the rock, all these miracles. But verse 5, but with many of them, God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. And it says these things were, were for our examples. Verse uh, 11 says it like this. Now all these things happened to them for in samples. I'll read this again from the living 
Bible, verse 11, says, All these things happened as examples, object lessons to us, to warn us against doing the same things. They're written down so we could read about them and learn from them in these last days as the world nears its end. So be careful if you're thinking, oh, I would never behave like that. Let this be a warning to you. So that's why we're taking the time to do these things, to study them, because the Lord told us to in the New Testament. And this is how we become uh, prepared and uh, so that the enemy's effectiveness is prevented because we're not ignorant of his devices. We can see this stuff coming and we don't let it get started. And so if it never gets started, it never gets bad and it never robs us. Come on, can you see this? But now you'll have to, you'll have to do something different than most of the world is doing. You will have to think differently, believe differently, talk differently, act and react differently because the whole world is in a flow of unbelief and fear. And the enemy, the 2 Corinthians 4, calls the devil the God of this world. And Ephesians talks about the, the spirit of disobedience is over the whole thing. By and large, the mankind in the world, the earth, is in full-on rebellion against God. But not us. I said not us. By the grace of God, not us. But you'll have to watch about, well, that's what the Bible says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The enemy is really crafty. He's subtle. Even things that are seemingly just funny, if it's ungodly, there's biting sarcasm in it, and there is disrespect, and there's always trying to... Uh, the enemy's trying to weave something of death in it so that he can uh, get something in your mouth, get you talking it even for years so that he has something to act on against you. But uh, say it out loud, I'm not ignorant, I'm not ignorant of Satan's devices, Satan's devices. And, the Spirit and the Holy Spirit helps me. Helps me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Go to Exodus again, the 14th chapter, and we've been studying this first example. There were 10 of these, and we're looking at the first one here. It's what happened at the Red Sea. Exodus 14, uh, Pharaoh, after having let the people go, decided that he is going to go get them, and he takes all of his army hundreds and hundreds of chariots and horsemen and I reckon uh, thousands of foot soldiers on top of that, his whole army. And when they, the Lord told Moses and the people this was going to happen. And he even told them how it's going to turn out. That he was going to be honored upon Pharaoh and the Egyptians would know that the God of the Hebrews is God. The real God. Now, just based on that, you should be able to expect a good outcome if you're God's people. But when they saw, verse 10, when the, when the Pharaoh drew near and the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, they were what? Sore afraid. One translation says exceedingly afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Now, this wasn't in believing prayer, but in panic and desperation. And, and they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt have you, that you've taken us to die in the wilderness, wherefore have you dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is, is not this the word that we did tell you in Egypt, saying, let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness." And what's the first thing Moses replies to that? Fear ye not. Don't fear. Now, if you've read the Bible, you've been around things where the Bible is, is read and mentioned, you've heard that phrase, fear not. Right? 
I mean, most of the time, if an angel showed up with a message, that's how he starts. Fear not. <laughs> right? And you hear it so often that you can get to where you don't pay attention to it. You think it's just a greeting. Like, hi, how you doing? Fear not. Mm -mm. It's a charge. Why? Because fear interferes. Fear interferes with what God wants to do. Can get in the way. Can cause people to miss out. And there, so that's why, again and again, the Lord will lead with that. Don't fear. Stop fearing. Uh, with that in mind, go to Luke, one of the clearest cases of this in the ministry of Jesus. Luke 8 is uh, with Jairus' daughter. You see this. Luke 8, 49, it says, While he yet spake, there came one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Your daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, what did he tell him? He answered him saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be whole. Why would he say that? I mean, if he's going to take care of it no matter what, what does it matter if J. Iris is afraid or not? Come on, are you with me? Why does he say this? And why does he say this multiple times? It's because this can mess up what's happening. Isn't that what Hebrews warned us about? Isn't that what 1 Corinthians warned us about? We read that in the living, you know, beware, uh, lest the, these same kind of thing happen to you. You can be robbed if you let yourself get into fear. And, and into the following unbelief that, that accompanies it. And, and the words that they came and spoke to him uh, would have taken, you know, put fear in you and taken hope out of you if you'd listened to it. Because he came and told Jesus, my little daughter is at home. She's sick. She's at the point of death. But, but come, and if you'll lay your hands on her, she'll live. Well, that's why he's in the book. That's faith. Come on, can you hear that? He believes something can happen. And so Jesus says, I'll come. And he's going with him. But before they can get there, people come from his house and say, don't bother the master anymore. Uh, she's dead. She's gone. It's, it's too late. Do you reckon fear hit him? Oh yeah, you can be sure of it. Else why would Jesus say, fear not? Why, why would Jesus say that? Because fear hit this man. You know, oh, I've waited too late. Oh, we didn't move quick enough. Oh, this, oh, that. It's over. Oh, my little girl. Oh, my little girl. And Jesus looks, says, hey, hey, hey. Hey, don't fear. Believe only. And she'll live. Why do that? If it was going to happen anyway. See, Jesus said, contrary to how a lot of people believe, Jesus himself said, I can of my own self do nothing. Did he say that or not? He said that. And in his own hometown. Mark 6. Matthew talks about this. Matthew 13. It said he could there do no mighty works. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Unbelief shut Jesus down. Jesus. In his own hometown. That's not widely preached though. You know what is preach? Jesus is the Son of God. He can do anything He wants to, whoever He wants to, He's God. He can do anything. That's not what He said. And it sounds like it's being respectful, and yet it ain't respectful to contradict what the Lord said. 
And yes, God is all-powerful. And yes, Jesus was and is the Son of God. But God doesn't make people do things. He gives us a choice. And even salvation. What's the message? Go into all the world. Preach the good news to everybody, every created being. He that believes and acts on it, is baptized, will be saved. He that what? Believes not, will be saved anyway? Because it's the will of God? Because Jesus already paid for it? No. 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 Because it's not the will of God for him to be saved? No. If you believe not, you won't be saved. You'll be condemned. Even though it was God's will. Can you see this class? When you begin to understand these things, you see why unbelief is called evil. Evil. Because it is robbing people of what they could have. It robbed them of Canaan's land. And here, the reason this is in the book is Jesus is helping this man not to get robbed right now. Can you see that things... This situation, the outcome of this situation is being made or broken right here. When they come and tell him, it's too late. She's gone. You you know, let the preacher go on. No need him coming. And there was no delay. When Jesus heard what they said, immediately... He answered, not them, but the man. He looks at him, and what does he say? Come on, help me out. What does he say? What does he say? Fear not. Why would he say that? Does it matter? Will it affect the outcome? See, a lot of people don't believe so. They say, no, 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 Jesus is the Son of God. He, He would have gone and done it anyway. He didn't in his hometown. No, he didn't. He could there do no mighty works. We'd say he couldn't. Not he wouldn't. I'm quoting scripture. He couldn't do any mighty works there. Why? He marveled at how bad their unbelief was. And he goes on to talk about how he went about to fix it. He went about their villages and cities teaching (laughs) and preaching. The king, ha, faith comes by hearing. Right? That's, That's the cure for unbelief is to, instead of looking at the wrong thing, feeding on the wrong thing, hear the right thing. Keep feeding on the right thing. And so Jesus says to Jairus, hey, hey, don't fear. Fear not. Believe only. Don't do that. Just do this. And she'll live. She'll live. You know, you know what he did? What did he do? He didn't say anything about being afraid. He didn't say anything about there's no need in you coming. He, I don't know if he smiled and nodded or just nodded or said, okay. <laughs> I don't know, but he didn't fight Jesus. He didn't argue with him. He worked with him and he'll do the same thing with you. He'll do the same thing with me. In in our toughest moments, when you feel almost paralyzed with fear or panic, let him help you. Bite your lip if you're about to say a bunch of unbelieving junk and a bunch of fear junk and a bunch of stuff about giving up and blaming people and all this junk like we hear these are the first. Don't yield to that ugly spirit of unbelief. What do you do? You say, Lord, what do I say? And he'll say, you know what he'll say first off? Fear not. This is not just a greeting. This is not just a a phrase for no reason. Fear not. How many believe there's power in those words to help you not to fear? Right? (laughs) Fear not. And oh, if you'll listen, I'm telling you, I, I I can sense it in the spirit right now. 
There will come situations, maybe today or tomorrow or next week or next year, some situations will come up and you will hear the Spirit of God speak up in your spirit, fear not. Fear not. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of this. Don't be afraid of this report. Don't be afraid of these symptoms. Don't be afraid of this thing. Don't be afraid. What do you need to say? Help me out, class. What do you need to say? Okay. Yes. Okay. Fear I resist you. Right? Agree with him. Work with him. And immediately you'll find courage begin to come up in you. Confidence and help begin to come, in, come up in you. Hallelujah. <laughs> this is how you win. This is how you overcome. This is how you triumph. Can you say amen? amen? He said, fear not. Believe only and she shall be made whole. Oh, somebody say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God is such a good God. He's such a faithful father. We talked a little bit about on, on yesterday's uh, class about the law of fear and how that when they kept saying, we're all going to die out here in the wilderness, by the time they got to the 10th um, trial of their faith, they're still saying the same thing. They said it every time. We're all going to die out here in the wilderness. Where did they get that from? That came from the enemy. Whether they knew it or not, the enemy will always try to get death in your mouth. Because he used to have the power of death. That's been his thing. But the Lord has conquered him and triumphed over him. And so he has to get you to speak death over yourself. To give him and his cohort something to work with. And if we were smart and knowledgeable, we would never speak death over ourselves. But when you begin to get enlightened a little bit, you will see death woven in to popular culture, songs, poetry, programs, comedy, everywhere. Why? Because the God of this world wants death in your mouth so he can work death in your life. Mm -hmm. Notice how many times people are talking about, you know, in songs, you know, uh, about dying, about going insane, about going crazy. It's just woven in so much of the, uh, of, of the songs and, and in literature. And, and why wouldn't you say, you know, um, uh, I laughed till I thought I would uh, go to heaven. <laughs> no, uh, you know, uh, scared me to life. No, no, <laughs> right? What? It's, uh, it's always what? See, and, and cursing, foul language is more than something that's just not nice. Again, it has to do with damning things, cursing things, slandering and disrespect and death. It's not a non-issue. Whether, whether a person believes it or not, the devil knows words matter. He knows that more than human beings know it. And so he wants to get death in your mouth. In Job, turn there and look. In the book of Job, talking about the, uh, the law of, of fear, you know what happened to Job, if you've read the first couple of chapters in the book, um, the scripture says the devil caused people to come against him and attack his things and his people and steal from him and that the devil caused a storm to uh, come and destroy the house his children were in and kill them. The Bible says the devil did all that. And even then that the devil came and, and affected him physically with boils and sores on his body so that he lost his physical health. 
And notice what Job says in the third chapter and the 25th verse, Job 3, 25. He says, the thing I greatly feared is come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. The literal standard version says, I feared a fear and it meets me. And what I was afraid of comes to me. Can you see why, why we call it the law of fear? There are laws that govern spiritual things just like natural things. There's a law of gravity. You jump off the house, you don't go up. Right? It's because it's a law. It doesn't matter who you are, how old you are, how young, old, big, rich, poor. No, it doesn't matter. Jump off the house, you go down. And this is a law that if you fear something, it draws it to you. Most people don't believe it, but it's Bible, and you see it. Um, Brenton's Septuagint translation says, The terror I meditated has come upon me. The New Living says, What I always feared has happened to me, and what I dreaded has come true. The New English says, The very thing I dreaded has happened to me. Is that coincidence? That the, the exact thing he was so afraid of is what happened to him. Coincidence? Not a coincidence. And in the end, we saw in Numbers 14, when the Lord said, finally, what you've said is what's going to happen to you. What? You're going to die in the wilderness. Is that a coincidence? That that's what they've been afraid of, and that's what they've been saying Time after time after time after time. No, it's not a coincidence. It's a law. And yet most of the world doesn't believe that. They, they don't believe there's any connection between being afraid of something and it happening to you. But it is. Said out loud, God didn't give me the spirit of fear. I refuse to fear. I will always stand strong against every fear every terror, every dread. I refuse to fear in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You keep doing that and you'll be kept safe, child of God. And our time's up for the day. Come back next time. We'll learn more how to get out and stay out of this stinking unbelief. See you next time here in Faith School. I've got no Thank you for joining us at Faith School. Class is dismissed for today, but you can watch this and other episodes of Faith School free of charge at faithschool.org. For more information, visit our website or call us at 941-702-7390.